this is kind of brand new. We've never had this happen before. We've never had to, re, uh, to duplicate two thirds of our ballots. We begin at five with the Clackamas County clerk in damage control, trying to explain why her team did not live up to promises to report election results in a timely manner, even as she knew there was a significant problem two weeks in advance as several key races nearly a day after polls close still hang in the balance here. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko and I'm Laurel Porter. Today Clackamas County's Elections Division is getting a lot of criticism for not gearing up better for a problem it knew about for weeks. Tim Gordon is in Oregon City where they're still counting and Tim this has to do with those blurry barcodes on ballots. Yeah, that's right, Laurel, and that makes it impossible for them to process those with high-speed machines. So now they're going through tens of thousands of ballots slowly by hand. Now, elections clerk or county clerk Sherry Hall just finished talking with the media. She said more help is on the way. And this is what she told our Catherine Cook when asked if she was handling this with enough urgency. It seems that way, right? Because last night's results was only 10,000 to uh, 300 or so ballots. Um, we have spent a lot of time just kind of trying to figure things out. There's been a lot of interruptions too. The press really has been in the office a lot and um, there's lots of interruptions, but this is going to go better from tomorrow on. Are you blaming the press? No, I'm just saying uh, there's a whole bunch of things that have just come up that have had to be addressed. Okay, so this is really a big deal. We're talking about two thirds or roughly 60,000 of the 90,000 ballots Clackamas County expects to process in this important primary election. As we said, they knew about this and now have pairs of bipartisan elections workers taking these bad ballots and duplicating them so they can be processed. As we said, it's uh, the approved way to do it, but it's so slow. Now, the county clerk had offers to get more help on board but really didn't accept that help right away. Now a flood of ballots are in and there has been very little in the way of results out of Clackamas County. Today, an emergency meeting of the Board of Commissioners with the county administrator offering up as many as 200 county workers a day to help the process. And the clerk was there earlier, Sherry Hall, and had this to say about the ballot counting debacle. It would be great if this problem just disappeared and a miracle happened and they could be read, every single one of them. But Otherwise, we have to do what we have to do. This was a big mistake. It was a huge mistake. And it's not one that I'm happy with at all. But this is the hand we're dealt. We have to fix it and we have to move forward. To uh, Chair uh, Tutti Smith, after the emergency meeting, having her own news conference and putting this on Hall, who is also an elected official. So a tough time down here, and it's going to be days, possibly weeks before this is resolved for the voters and some candidates in some very key races. We know they've got to get it done by June 13th. That's when this election will be certified. Back to you in the studio. You know, and just for the county clerk here, this is not going to go away. And you know who loses, Tim? 60,000 plus voters who got their ballots back on time. Tim Gordon in Oregon City. Thank you. Let's talk about the race for governor now. You see it here. The Oregonian now projecting this afternoon that former House Minority Leader Christine Drazen will be the Republican nominee. And that comes on the heels of one of the earliest calls on election night. Former House Speaker Tina Kotek taking the top spot on the Democratic ballot. And with the two plus a third unaffiliated and high profile candidate in the mix. This November's race is promising to be both historic and expensive. Galen Etlin breaks it down. In the packed race for Oregon governor, three will remain in November. Democrat Tina Kotek on the left, moderate Betsy Johnson in the middle, running not affiliated with a party, and Republican Christine Drazen on the right. It's a really powerful moment for Oregon. Rebecca Tweed is a political consultant watching history unfold with women from three parties. Three very strong women, very credible, very intelligent. Uh, that's probably something that hasn't happened before. No, it, it definitely has not happened before. Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kafori is part of the broader legacy in Oregon of women in leadership. Brings some momentum to government. Her mother, Gretchen Kafori, was a trailblazer. She wanted women to be in the room when it happened. In the 70s, Gretchen joined a group of women pushing back against the City Club of Portland. Another rolling pin in her hand protesting the fact that women were not allowed in. That 50-plus year policy was overturned 
paving the way for women to lead. It's been taken years and years and years of work. Well, Oregonians love voting for women. Political analysts like Len Bergstein and Rebecca Tweed say November's gubernatorial race will likely be the most expensive in Oregon's history. And a really interesting campaign to watch. With three nominees spanning the political spectrum, these three women have their work cut out for them. Everybody working together, we're going to win in November. They'll have to earn swing votes and prove how they stand out. It's time to lead our state in a new direction. Only two of Oregon's 38 governors have been women, Barbara Roberts and Kate Brown, both Democrats. So now this year, no matter how the election turns out in November, we will have another woman in the room where it happens. Representation will grow. Galen Etlin, KGW News. History being made, a lot to watch as we head to November. We talked to elections officials in Multnomah County to get an update on the count remaining there. Director of Elections Tim Scott says there are still 40,000 ballots from Election Day left to count. And there are even more with the new rule allowing ballots to be postmarked on Election Day. We got a lot of ballots back yesterday morning from the mail, um, which is pretty unusual. And then this morning we got a lot. We, even, we got more than we got yesterday. Um, we got about 13,500 ballots from the post office this morning. And so those are not part of the 40,000 yet. Um, those, once we get through the ballots received on election day, we'll start working on those ballots received from the post office. Scott says staffing and COVID issues have slowed the count. And those outstanding ballots could have a big impact on who is in the runoff for city council position three. You see it here, Joanne Hardesty, the incumbent, well ahead about 41% of the vote there. That's been counted. Renee Gonzalez and Vadim Mozierski really still in a tight race here to see who will join Hardesty in that runoff in November. Uh, also on city council position two, Dan Ryan, the incumbent there, will hold on to his seat. One race we're also keeping a close eye on is this tightly contested race for the U.S. House in District 5. Jamie McLeod Skinner is leading incumbent Kurt Schrader by a 60 to 40 percent margin. If Schrader loses, it would be the first time since 1980 that an incumbent member of Oregon's congressional delegation lost a primary. But as we mentioned, that could change depending on what happens because there are a lot of votes still uncounted in Clackamas County. About half the Democrats are from Clackamas County in this district. Well, and there are a number of other races without a projected winner here. Full results as they continue to come in over the days and potentially, we are sorry to say this, weeks ahead. That's all for you at KGW.com. Just click on the results graphic near the top of the page there. Now for some news on the COVID front. The pandemic is not yet over. That's the message from state health officials tonight. They say highly transmissible subvariants of Omicron are making more and more people sick. During a virtual press conference Wednesday morning, Dr. Dean Seidlinger said COVID cases and hospitalizations have doubled in recent weeks. All of that said, the state epidemiologist does not think the state will implement any drastic measures like a masking mandate. For now, Dr. Seidlinger says everyone needs to be extra careful, especially those at high risk of severe illness. Those with underlying medical conditions or who are immunocompromised should consider contacting their healthcare providers now to make a plan to get tested and receive treatment should they become ill. Dr. Seidlinger encourages anyone with these risk factors to wear masks in indoor public settings. Everyone else should evaluate their own circumstances and act accordingly. Well, now to the trial of romance novelist Nancy Crampton Brophy. And today, defense rested its case before the DA picked up with a new witness, her former cellmate. So let's bring in Bryant Clerkley, who's been following every twist and turn for six weeks now. And Bryant, Nancy's accused of shooting and killing her husband, Dan. She has said over and over again on the stand she did not do it. Except this witness, a woman who she was in jail with, seems to have some new details about the murder, so to speak, the jury hadn't heard yet. Yeah, David, we've heard testimony from Nancy herself during this week. The prosecution pressed her on her whereabouts the morning of the murder and the ghost gun that she bought online. And today we heard from former cellmate Andrea Jacobs. Jacobs is currently serving her 48 month sentence at a prison in Texas. She told jurors she was previously housed with Crampton Brophy and they became friends. Jacobs said she and Nancy spoke on a daily basis. The state says Jacobs told detectives that Crampton Brophy told her she was feet away from her husband when he was killed. Jacobs told jurors she did not want to testify in this case and her testimony is not benefiting her own case. 
She told me that he was shot two times to the heart and um, that, it, and she showed me the distance. She said he was shot two times to the heart and she said it was about, and she used her arm span because I said, wow, that's must have been close up, you know, and she used her arm span and said, well, it was about this far. And that's... Nancy's defense team questioned Jacobs' credibility because Jacobs has been charged with fraud and identity theft. The state says Crampton Brophy lied about her whereabouts the morning of the murder and was set to gain a large amount of money from her husband's death. The defense says the Brophys were so in love that Nancy would never kill her husband. This trial is expected to wrap up this Friday or Monday of next week. David Brian Clerkley following every twist and turn as we said here. Thank you. A quick programming note note now this week. KGW's investigative team is taking a unique look at Portland's homeless crisis. So join us tomorrow for the premiere of our KGW original documentary titled one day. Our team of journalists captured more than a dozen stories over a single day that show the scope and the impact of this crisis. You can watch one day tomorrow at 7 p.m. right here on KGW or stream at any time starting Thursday on the KGW YouTube page.